Okay, uh, everyone, what's up? Goldie here. And I'm going to be going over the uh, short six game main we have here on Thursday, uh, August 3. See if I can get the day right today. Um, short six games. So hopefully we can get through this pretty quickly. Don't want to get too deep, but uh, well, I say that every day, and sure enough, we end up at an hour every day. Um, some decent pitching here today. Uh, on this short slate, I'm not going to be going over the early slate. We do have projections and everything up for that. However, short little four gamer uh, with like a Flaherty making his Baltimore debut, for example, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but we do have projections and ownership and even a, a vid here for the main slate. Uh, everything's loaded to the site and to Sabersim already. Uh, it's a Shohei day. Um, naturally, we've got a ridiculous ownership standard deviation so far so um somebody not projecting him still as a hitter uh it's kind of frustrating but uh, is what it is this will flesh out by the end of the day um housekeeping notes quickly uh i will not be putting up any projections for the weekend i will be out of town um don't have it quite automated uh, just yet so just gonna have to kind of bear with us a little bit and we should be back into the full swing of things, um, you know, next week sometime. So um, that aside, let's uh, let's just get into the game, see if we can blast through some stuff here and uh, maybe find uh, an equitable spot or two. Houston and the Yankees at Yankee Stadium. Christian Javier, 8,600. Going for Houston. Um, okay, all right, this is all right. Uh, 8,600. I think this, this matchup is fine, mostly because the Yankees strike out a crap load against right-handers um you know they, they they're still very much attackable um you know they in aggregate the the number is only about average right 22 and a half 23 percent here you know but with judge back he strikes out 25 percent clip right so stanton still strikes out uh bowers will whiff etc etc volpe too um you know these guys are they're just swinging miss a little bit said you know glaber 22 percent or whatever uh, is not 16% like you see with a lot of the guys on the other side of the game um, for Houston. We'll get to them in a sec. So I think Javier, given his drastic splits this season, he's got a 31% K rate to the righties, just a 17% K rate to the lefties, right? Far, far more attackable uh, in terms of just raw batting average, right? Base runners, power, swing and miss etc. Uh, with left-handers than he is with right-handers. So, um, you know, the, the numbers against righties are pretty damn fantastic. 173 batting average, 251 Woba, 151 ISO. That, you know, okay, whatever. A little high there, but it's because he's an 035 ground ball to fly ball guy against right side with 39% hard contact. So he will give up some pop um, in the air a little bit, certainly in the air. Uh, and he will give up some hard contact. So if you want a homer hunt against Christian Javier, that's okay. I generally don't like stacking against Javier. I mean... Historically, I've kind of loved stacking against him because these hard contact figures have just been egregious for a long time. Um, but he's hard to stack against sometimes because of this heavy, heavy fly ball lean. Uh, it's just so many fly balls that stacking against him in DFS, you need base runners, right? And not just a lot of weak sort of fly ball type of contact. And in the opposite end of the platoon, even though he does give up pop there, 210 ISO with the elevated numbers as we talked about, he still induces 19% soft contact against the lefties. So he gets some pop-ups as well and just a 28-29% hard contact rate, right? So if the, if we were seeing a 39% hard contact rate like we do or like we have against the righties, against the lefties as well, I mean, this would be a smash play every single day. Um, and we'd probably see Christian Javier down at like the mid to low 7Ks, something like that, right? But because he's so efficient strikeout wise with against the right handers and hard contact wise against the lefties um you know he's up in the mid 8ks and i think this is right about where he should be uh given the drastic split so that said uh, i do think a yankee stack is in play it's not necessarily my favorite uh they're probably only gonna have two maybe three lefties in here tonight uh jake bowers they might lead him off um against the lefty it's probably a good spot for that uh, for them to do that, but who knows what the hell Booney's doing over here. Um, he just clicks buttons a lot of times. Anthony Rizzo should be back in there tonight. 3,900 for him. I think this is an okay spot as well. 
um, you know, just the 17% Ks to the lefties, as we talked about with Javier. A lot of fly balls. Now, the batted ball profile for some of these guys from the Yankees, certainly from the left side, Bowers and Rizzo in particular, not going to be all that favorable to them and more so to uh, Javier because you don't generally want heavy fly ball hitters uh, against fly ball pitchers, right? Um, that turns into a lot of weak pop-ups and, uh, and and things like that, especially when there's not a lot of hard contact involved. So um, not my favorite really playing a lot of the Yankees here, but uh, so I'd have to just side with Javier. There's going to be far more righties in the lineup, number one, um, and some of them are going to strike out, right? Stanton Judge for sure. And DJ, not so much, but uh, not a whole lot of upside there for DJ anymore. It's it's a nice batted ball profile matchup for him because he hits so many ground balls here. Uh, this could turn into a, a decent line drive matchup for DJ. Same thing with like a Harrison Bader. It's okay there. Same thing with Glaber, right? So a, a Yankee stack can be had similar to yesterday going after McClanahan. Turns out he was just hurt, and he's probably going to end up with something torn in his forearm. Um, you know, that said... You know, we can't really just be stacking teams because we're expecting guys to get hurt or anything. Um, batted ball profile-wise, the Yankees can be in play here tonight. Uh, and I, I think it's viable. These Both of these guys are fly ball pitchers. Uh, or, you know, neutral over here in the case of Clark Schmidt. 7,200 on the mound for him. Um, for the Yankees, I don't want anything to do with this tonight. Uh, he's got serious problems to left-handers as well. A lot of batting average, very high Woba here. Not necessarily because it's a super high walk rate. It's just production, right? 220 ISO, and it's been this way all season uh, for Clarkie here. So I don't want anything to do with this. Um, the only thing that's really going to prevent us from getting to all of the Houston in the world is the price tags right? for these guys, right? Kyle Tucker at 5,700 is is good. I mean, he's a good hitter, let me put it that way. But, like, that's very hard to stomach and hard to get to when we want to get to expensive pitching today. Same thing with Jordan Alvarez. He's 6,000. I don't have a problem playing them from a fundamental standpoint against pretty much anybody in baseball, these guys. Uh, but it's a price tag, and, you know, you got to consider that. This is a good fundamental spot, of course, against Clark Schmidt. Neutral ground ball to fly ball. They're, they're going to get the baseball in the air. They're not going to strike out, nor will Altuve. He's got really Pretty good numbers production-wise against righties in the limited sample for him this season. Um, Jeremy Pena, he's going to strike out a little bit. They probably won't even have him in the two-hole. I don't know what the hell Dusty... I talked about this yesterday, the day before. Uh, what Dusty is doing down here, putting Jordan Alvarez in the five-hole. Um, he needs to be in the two-hole absolutely against right-handers that have problems with lefties. This is an egregious mistake um, in lineup construction. I know Dusty is a very good manager, but he is a classical manager, and... You have to adjust and get your best hitters the most at-bats that you can. Uh, putting him in the five-hole is a big, big leak. Um, so hopefully he doesn't do that tonight and doesn't put Jeremy Pena there because it really tanks the upside of the top half of the lineup if he does that. So that would take me off of some Houston stacks if Pena's in the two because there's going to be a lot of strikeouts there for him because Clark Schmidt, very good against righties in terms of suppression allowed, right? Just sub-240 batting average, 290 Woba. 173 ISO because he's still going to give up a little bit of hard contact and some pop, but a 26% K rate there. That's a big delta in swing and miss with righties to the lefties. So um, mostly left-handers in general, but there's enough power here and uh, just a neutral ground ball to fly ball. There's going to be a lot of contact from Houston's uh, perspective here because Clark pitches to 79% himself, and Houston, the, these top five guys, they do not strike out. Uh, I mean, outside of Jeremy Pena, right? The top four don't strike out at all. Um, hopefully, Yiner Diaz is in there tonight. He's got fantastic numbers in his debut season against right-handers. Uh, so I would really like to play him. He's 3,900. Not great, but that will keep his ownership down a little bit. Um, he'd be the catcher I prefer, certainly, to Martin Maldonado. Chas McCormick's got great numbers. He, he's having a fantastic season. Jose Abreu been a little bit better Um you know, he's striking out a little bit. So there's some strikeouts to be had with Chaz, with a Corey Jolks, uh, and Josie Abreu right down at the bottom of that of the lineup here. Uh, but the top half is going to be incredibly difficult to get through. So that's why I don't really want anything to do with Clark Schmidt here tonight. I think uh, Houston is a kind of a, a middle-tier, very high upside stack going after um, you know, a neutral ground ball to fly ball guy in Yankee Stadium that gives up some hard contact and some pop. So um, Houston is viable if you can make stacks happen. 
go ahead right with the price tags. I, I'd love to stack everybody, probably stay off of some Jeremy Pena um, and mix in a Chaz, mix in a Yiner Diaz, something like that with the other guys, Altuve, uh, Bregman, Tucker, and Alvarez, if you can make the price tags happen. So that's how I'd like to play this. Um, some Javier, yeah, I think he's in play. Not a ton of value. I don't think we can squeeze out of this price tag necessarily, but the ownership is fine, and he does have a good bit of swing and miss upside here. Um, but don't be surprised if he walks somebody because he's got a 54% strike one rate, right, and then gives up a dinger to Aaron Judge or something. I think it's pretty viable that Judge gets there tonight. But uh, I don't really want to be going out of my way to be stacking a lot of the Yankees. I think I'd kind of have to side here with a little bit of Javier. But I'm not overly comfortable with it because of this hard contact rate and so many fly balls in Yankee Stadium. Okay, let's move on. Pittsburgh, Milwaukee. Mitch Keller, I like this a little bit here at 9,100. 16% ownership so far is good, too. Plate discipline is really, really strong outside of just the lack of swinging strikes, right? 28%, 29%. Um, CSW is very, very good. Right, 19% call strike rate is an elite figure. If he can tick this up to 14%, 13% swing strikes, uh, we're talking a, you know, a top five arsenal in baseball. And I've talked about this several times. I love the fastball mix from Mitch Keller. It's just so, so good. Um, you know, one of the better you know, three pitch quivers in all of baseball. It's the breaking stuff and the lack of a, a good changeup that really plagues Mitch, Mitch Keller a lot of the time. Um, pitches to contact because he's mostly two-seamer cutter here. Uh, it does throw 25% of the four-seamer, right? That's where he gets some swing and miss on the fastball. Um, but lack of a swing and miss fastball arsenal here with the two-seamer cutter um, and no changeup is really kind of what plagues him, certainly against lefties, and we see that materialize. 1.6 homers per nine. He does have swing and miss, though, with the slider curveball a little bit and a tiny bit of the change, but he'll float this here, and this is not an equitable um, secondary arsenal here. 217 ISO to the lefties, 343 Woba, and a 260 batting average. So he's a little bit attackable there, 9.5% aggregate barrel rate. You can go after him a little bit with mostly lefties. I don't want a single righty against him. He induces a buck fifty ground ball to fly ball, only has a 25% hard contact rate to the right side, and gives up an 080 ISO with a 212 batting average. So no thank you there. Um, I certainly don't want to be playing Willie Contreras or Willie Adamas in this particular matchup at, their, at those price tags. Nor do I want Marcana because he kind of stinks, uh, or Monasterio because he's a young hitter and kind of stinks. Um, Bryce Terang from the left side is okay, but he's going to strike out a lot in this matchup. Um, Yelich would have to be the favorite, same with Sal Freelick, as maybe one-offs, but they're, they're kind of normal price tags, and for the most part, I think this is a little bit of a down matchup. Yelich still get to hit two ground balls per fly ball against righties here, and... I really respect Mitch Keller, um, even though he's got some power issues. He, do, he does still have swing and miss and some ground balls to lean on a little bit to the left side of the plate. Um, so I guess the favorite here, it, like it's got to be Yelich just because he makes 50% hard contact against righties. Um, you know, but I don't want to play him at 5,600 necessarily. I, after that, you know, price adjusted, it's got to be uh, Freelick you know, from a DFS perspective, but... Um, that's not all that thrilling either. Uh, perhaps it would have to be then Carlos Santana, right? He didn't strike out at all. He can lift the baseball a little bit, um, getting his old team, you know, as it were 3,800, but you got to play him at sole first base here. That kind of stinks. So not overly thrilled with some Milwaukee. I think I just have to side with Mitch Keller, um, get a leverage piece like a Carlos Santana. He's been very good against righties this season, power wise, at least. Um, so that's a, a viable play. And this is in Milwaukee at American Family. Slightly more hitter-friendly than PNC over in Pittsburgh, of course. So give me uh, some Mitch Keller. I like the ownership here. Um, you can anchor with him as an SP1, uh, or you can you know, run him with an SP2 if you get to uh, an Otani or a Urias, who we'll get to later. Adrian Hauser, 5,200 for the Brewers. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, he's 5,200, right? This price tag has to put him in play, and he's def he's absolutely in play because he induces so many ground balls to the right side. Over two ground balls per fly ball to the righties is an elite figure. The problem with Hauser is that, well, number one, he pitches to 86% contact. He doesn't have any swing and miss whatsoever, right? 6.5% swinging strike rate, 23% CSW. 
and 56% strike one, right? He gets behind in counts, and he can't make it up because he doesn't have any raw swing and miss. He's just hoping to rely on ground balls and weak contact. And unfortunately for Hauser, there's just a lot of pure contact. Not necessarily that it's bad, but, I mean, to lefties, he gets hit around pretty damn good. 274 batting average, 360 Woba, 13% walk rate, 1 in 75, 180 ISO nearly with an 18% K rate, right? 37% hard contact to the lefties and fly balls, 080 ground ball to fly ball. It's it's attackable for sure. So give me some of the lefties over here from Pittsburgh. Um you know, notably a Brian Reynolds. I really like this play at 4,500. I think this is a good batted ball matchup. Jackson Winsky, I love the price tag at 36. Not so much the fly, uh, ground ball to fly ball profile matchup here because uh, he's a heavy fly ball hitter, but he makes a lot of hard contact, and it's still a, a very a pretty viable spot going after Hauser because he's not going to throw it past him, and that's Jackson Winsky's main problem is strikeouts. Um, Andy Rodriguez also striking out a lot here in the early going. But he's hitting from the left side, too. Still a very high upside hit tool for him. Um, and in this matchup, that's an okay spot because of the lack of strikeout stuff for Hauser. So give me some lefties here. Cabrian Hayes um, has been activated. And he should be back. He's actually not hitting against righties this season, at least, nearly as many ground balls as he has in the past. He's still a ground ball hitter, so you got to be careful there. Uh, 3,500, he would be okay to mix in in stacks because he's roughly a neutral ground ball to fly ball guy against righties this season. But still, not a lot of power, not a lot of hard contact, overly, you know, unimpressive, I, I would say. But he's 3,500. That's fine if you get to Pittsburgh stacks. Um McCutcheon is also okay. He's a contact guy. He'll walk a little bit. Henry Davis, um, high ground ball hitter, so I'd probably stay off of him, actually, in this particular matchup and, and prefer to pivot that elsewhere. So short stacks, I think, is probably the most equitable here for me, but I don't know. This 5,200, if you're going to want to get to a very expensive stack like the Dodgers, like Houston, uh, etc., you're going to have to make a kind of gulpy decision, and Adrian Hauser might... Um, you know, might be that key piece for you. At 5,200, he's at the bottom of his price range, and you can take buy shots here against, a, you know, what's a pretty low upside offense in general, certainly, that they traded Carlos Santana. He was one of their better hitters this year against right-handed pitching. So um, give me some Keller. Give me a little bit of the Pirates. I think I got a side with them. They're, you know, they're about a buck ten. Catching a dime into, into betting markets, I don't think that's bad. Um you know, you can take shots there, I think. It, Hauser pitches to 86% contact. This is just way too high in general. So the opposing offense is always going to have upside. Uh, and Pittsburgh is not a totally, um, you know, worthless offense over here from the left side of the plate. A couple guys are, are very much playable, certainly in DFS. But both sides absolutely in play. I'm going to probably stay mostly off of the Brewers, but... Um, you know, I think pretty much everybody is in play here to a certain extent. And it's just a six-game slate. You can really do whatever the hell you want. All right, Sonny Gray for the Twins against the Cardinals. At this price tag, I don't know, man. At, at 9400 he has just been absolutely mediocre. Like, top to bottom this season, he's got about 15 starts of 15 DK points or less. He's got three, maybe five starts, whatever, um, north of 20. He's popped for 30, like two or three times, but that hasn't been in two or even three months. He is, just, and he's still at 9,400. Like the results are just not there for Sonny. The walk rate has ticked up for him this year. The swing and miss against the lefties is totally gone. He just doesn't give up any power, right? He still induces a lot of ground balls, buck 60 in aggregate per fly ball, which is really strong, and a hell of a lot of ground balls pushing 2 0 per fly ball. Uh, to the left side, which is really, really strong. It's just a lack of pure strikeout stuff that leaves it leaves it out there for him. Um, and in DFS, I think his upside is just capped at 9,400. I think it's super rare, especially in this matchup, that he's going to pop for 25 or more. Not that you'd necessarily need it. I think today you could probably get away with 20 points from pretty much any starting pitcher, and you know, you'd be uh, relatively satisfied with that. Um, and he has that in the tank here just because he 
doesn't give up a lot of power, right? The suppression numbers are still pretty damn good. 250 XBA, 311 X Woba, and a 128 X ISO. This is fantastic, right? He's really good against righties, but still over here from the Cardinals, we talked about this yesterday, um, they still make contact and really loud contact against guys that can pitch to some contact. Joe Ryan, certainly against right-handers, got beat up by a bunch of righties yesterday. And they got some good right-handed hitters over here that can still make contact despite a very high strikeout rate for Sonny against the righties, right? The left-handers is where he's most attackable. That's Nolan Nolan Gorman territory. He's the only, like, pure fly ball hitter from the left side of the plate. Lars is like a ground ball lean a little bit. Um, Tommy Edmond kind of stinks from the left side for the most part, right? You want him more as a right-hander, and et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not overly thrilled with playing the Cardinals because I think the upside for them is also capped because I do respect Sonny, but I don't want to play him at 9,400. I'd rather just pivot it elsewhere. Um, he's a fine tournament play here because he's he's got that 2022 20, in the tank. Um, it's just not all that probable or, or all that regular, I think, here against the Cardinals. So um, like I said, do I want to play them? Not really, you know, because I really respect Sonny. But, um, you yeah, know, they, they kind of have to be in play. It's a six-game slate. And if he only pops for eight points or something, well, the Cardinals are probably going to have a little bit to do with that, I would say, right? So, um, you know, they're in play, and Sonny is certainly in play at this ownership figure. But it is not a good fundamental spot. Um, really, a, a lot is pretty fishy here for Sonny. Uh, the, the results have just not been there. Are we looking for positive regression for him in terms of DFS outings? Yeah, maybe. Um, I think that's viable. If you want to play that angle at lower ownership on a short slate, sure, go ahead. But uh, I'm not going to go out of my way to do it. I'll probably just um, go elsewhere. Matt Libertor on the mound for the cards, 5600 for him. Like he's the price tag's got to put him in play. Now, if I got to choose, I'm going to choose Hauser. Um, I'm not going to do it happily, but this is why I'm going to do it. It's the line drive rate here for Libertor against both sides of the play. We got a short sample against lefties, whatever. Um, you know, but mostly the line drive rate to opposite-handed hitters for Libs is concerning, right? 25% with a 41% hard contact rate. Like, the numbers against righties this season are absolutely dreadful. Um, with this contact profile, he's going to get absolutely blasted. 350 batting average allowed, 406 Woba with a 12% walk rate. Buck 20, ground ball to fly ball. So it's not like he's inducing two ground balls per fly ball or anything with a 40% hard contact rate. That we could be a little bit, you know, I, I would say more okay with, I guess, right? But he's at a buck 20 here with a 25% line drive rate and a 180 ISO allowed. The 14% strikeout rate. Like, he's going to get absolutely bludgeoned here um, sometime soon if he does not get this hard contact profile under control. Doesn't have a change up and he throws a lot of a two-seamer to righties, and he shouldn't, right? He's got a bad four-seamer. He has zero equity in any one of these pitches here he's throwing five of them giving up a lot of production and outs to the field on everything he's still got a 580 xfip right um in 160 hitters that he's seen so far this year now 57 percent strand rate sure okay positive regression coming yeah he's got a 675 era with the expected you know at least the xfip pointing a little bit lower um you know, we have short sample noise with him, absolutely, but he's got a 10% walk rate, 58% strike one, 10% barrel rate, and just the 14% raw strikeout rate. So give me Hauser. He's at least got more viability to keep right-handers and some of the left-handers off the board in terms of just raw variance, but I think it's much less likely for Libertor. Even though I do not respect Minnesota's offense at all, uh, this team is terrible. Uh, Byron Buxton, literally, he's not even playing every day and he's still getting hurt somehow like it's just pathetic um carlos correa has been awful this season like just hitting the ball on the ground left and right not striking out but just not making any good contact um you know kyle farmer is is a good play here today he's got pr pretty okay numbers he's 2800 likely be in the middle of the lineup there georgie blanco hitting from the right side historically fine as well you know they're gonna platoon here against Libertor, and I think that makes them viable. But for the most part, you know, Libertor at 5,600, he still has to be in play because this is the Twins and they're garbage. So, eh, yeah, if you want to take shots, I mean, I'm not totally opposed to it. Uh, fundamentally, I, I would probably push back pretty hard at it 
Um, but from a price tag and ownership perspective on a six game slate, he's going to unlock a lot of stuff for you. So it's, it's viable if you've got the stones to do it. I personally don't. So that's why I would side with Hauser. Uh, he's a little bit cheaper and I think, um, he's just a better arm suppression wise. So I think this is a tough spot. Uh, but I mean, I'll probably stay off of the twins. They're going to be popular and this offense just sucks, man. They're so awful. And who knows? If, if Buxton is even going to be in there, like, I don't know, did he stub his toe, you know, walking to the clubhouse this morning or something? I mean, I don't know. It's just irritating with the guy. Um, so, you know, some of the right-handers here, mostly like Kyle Farmer, um, you know, you can get to some contrarian pieces for sure, and they're all very cheap. They will make Otani teams happen, you know, definitely. You can get to, like, Michael Taylor. I think this is okay. He's 2,200. I, I like that play. Um, so maybe like a really cheap short stack of Kyle Farmer, uh, Michael Taylor, and, oh, I don't know, Donnie Solano, if you want to play him at first base or something in that type of stack. That's super cheap, and that that's viable if you want to stack Houston or stack the Dodgers with it and get to Otani too. Yeah, sure. But, um, you know, I'm not overly thrilled with it. I think they're probably going to be too popular for the relative upside that they offer because they are bad. Uh, okay, let's move on to Cincinnati and the Cubs. Cubs, again, right, they're just going to be popular again because um, they get Luke Weaver today, and it's warranted once again because his numbers are awful against all sides of the plate. Cubs have to be the top stack of the day, um, certainly, and we'll go over it a little bit more when we get to the Dodgers, but Cubs are definitely the top stack here, and they really should be. They're probably going to be the most popular, Um there's, it'll be tied with the Dodgers and probably Minnesota as well. But you'll see a lot of ownership coming to Cincinnati. I think that's warranted too. I once again prefer Cincinnati um, in tournaments because they're not going to, going to be as popular. They're more expensive. That's naturally going to deflate their ownership a little bit. Um, and the Cubs here, I mean, I've got nothing wrong fundamentally. If we want to go after Luke Weaver, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it mostly with righties. You know, from a consistency standpoint, there's far more hard contact, 45% with more fly balls, right? 080 ground ball to fly ball to the righties. He's roughly neutral to the lefties, and he's got a changeup that he throws to the lefties at least. Um, and really no pure swing and miss pitch against the right-handers. He goes four-seamer cutter in the fastball arsenal with the changeup. So that's why he's slightly better against lefties with the cutter change, a little bit of swing and miss with the curveball. Um, or at least, you know, he has the curveball as a breaking pitch. Let's just put it that way. Not necessarily a swing and miss pitch. Um, and then against righties, however, he's the, he's the four seamer without a pure, you know, dive pitch, so to speak. And that's what gives him the fly ball lean. And, uh, a lot of power allowed, right? 326 batting average, 414 Woba. There's no walks, right? So this is all contact and all production. 295 ISO to the right-handers this year, 82% aggregate contact rate. So, yeah, go after the Cubs, play every single one of them. It doesn't really matter who. You could play 1-9. to nine, um, it, Like, you could play 6-9, six, six to 1-2, one, or whatever you want to do. Um, you're going to have to get contrarian with it because this is – absolutely, fundamentally the best stack of the day. Even at 6,000, I want nothing to do with Luke Weaver here tonight. Same thing with Jamison Tyon on the other side. I prefer the Reds once again because they're going to have all their better hitting lefties in the lineup tonight. Even though, like, Joey Votto got there last night, Smiley gives up a little bit of, um, you know, pop against left-handers. He always has, and sure enough, you know, Votto's still a pretty good hitter last time I checked. Uh, Ellie should be back tonight. She's got a day off. Friedel should be back in there, as will Jake Fraley. Will Benson as well, who's been fantastic over the last month and a half. Uh, he's got like 1,000, 10, 20 OPS or something um, against righties over the last six weeks. He's been excellent, and he's still just 3,200. That's a really, really good differentiation and cheap play, uh, mixing in Will Benson to your red stacks. Uh, we'll have to see what they want to do. Steer might be in there since he hit a bomb yesterday. Matt McLean, I probably want to stay off here because Jamison Tyon is fantastic against the right side. Still gives up a little bit of average, right? But no Woba, right? Very few base runners and no power. 092 ISO and a 25% strikeout rate. Um, no hard contact, a lot of soft contact against the righties. So I'm going to stay off of right-handers for the most part. 
And the Reds, they could probably go seven lefties in the lineup if they want. So I think full stacks, even including one righty here or there, is viable. Um, but I'm probably going to stay off of Matt McClain for the most part. He's 5,900, and this is a horrible matchup, and he strikes out a 30% clip. So uh, no thanks there. But I want Ellie, I want Friedel, Fraley, Votto. Uh, Votto at 4,300 is probably the best first base play of the day. Price adjusted, I think. Um, and, you know, from a fundamental perspective as well. Fraley at 43-2, I mean, it's, it's an excellent spot for the Reds. So I prefer them um, simply due to ownership. Delta between them and the Cubs, but uh, everybody from the offense here tonight is 90 degrees at Wrigley tonight, so go ahead. Uh, absolutely everyone, game stacks, um, you know, all of it is in play. Everybody about the pitching. Let's move on. Seattle and the Angels. Brian Wu, 7,500. Like, he's going to have to be in play because he's got a 30% carry to the righties. But the Angels now, they picked up some left handers. Um, you can't play Shohei, of course, because he's on the mound. But they've got Mike Boustakis. They have Mickey Moniak. They have Matt Theis. They have Ren Hifo leading off with Taylor Ward on the shelf. And probably, um, you know, his season's probably over. Brian Wu's got serious problems to the left side here. Yeah, we have a short sample. But in this early going, 40% hard contact, 050 ground ball to fly ball, 385 Woba. Like, my goodness, 70% strikeout rate. That is a pretty serious concern. Doesn't have a pure swing and miss pitch against the lefties. It's a lack of a changeup. Excuse me. Um, here are just three percent of the arsenal, and it's not very good, right? It's only about a seven, six, seven mile an hour velo delta to the fastballs. He needs to increase, um, increase that velo delta and decrease the spin rate on the change, and he'll get more value out of that. But um, you know, he's still a young arm. He just debuted what two months ago or something like that. So. Um, yeah, I want to stack the Angels, too, a little bit here, here at two as well. Uh, easy for me to spit out. Um, I think Renjifo is a really good second base play here today. He's good from both sides. He's a good contact hitter. And you guys may remember from last season when they had him leading off for a little while, he was excellent. Uh, when he gets into a rhythm, he's a very streaky hitter. And he makes good contact. He's got some pop. So 3,500 leading off in this spot, I think, is a very, very good play. And, of course, you could play Moustakas if you want to make a pivot off of, like, a pretty popular Kyle Farmer. Also at third base, Farmer's 2,800. Moose is 2,900. And he's still got a little bit of pop as well. He should be in the four or the five hole, something like that. Mickey Moniak at 5,100 is kind of an egregious price tag. But he certainly has pop. They may put him up at the top of the lineup in the three or something um, and move C.J. Crone down. But who knows? Uh, Nevin down here doesn't really have a clue how to build a, an equitable platoon lineup um so it's kind of tough to be super thrilled about stacking the angels because you can't play Ot otani um you know matt thice is fine behind the plate 3600 might be down at the bottom of the lineup because they're going to throw randall grichik and cj crone in there too so this isn't great full stacking the angels but i do like some short stacks and uh, once again this is a six game slate you can stack wherever the hell you want um but Brian Wu has been fantastic against the right side so far. 18, or excuse me, a 140 batting average, 180 Wobud, 050 ISO against righties, 33% strikeout rate, 32% soft contact rate. Yeah, this is all going to normalize and flatten out. We've got a lot of noise yet to flesh out for Brian Wu here because uh, we only have 10 starts on the guy. He's only seen 200 hitters. Um, so if you want to go after a guy that's displayed a, a pretty significant platoon split so far, by all means, you got my blessing. Um, not like you need it, of course, but uh, yeah, sure. Stack the Angels, too. They're kind of an off-the-board contrarian stack. And on a six-game slate, that's kind of what you're looking for. Shohei on the mound, 11,000. I've got really no problem here. Um, I, d I don't like Seattle's off it. They're just bad. Um, so I think getting to a lot of Shohei here is, is very much warranted. 37% ownership. I mean, it's the price tag that's keeping this down. And like I said, he'll probably be far, far higher than this as soon as we get the ownership shenanigans fleshed out by the end of the day. Um, you know, the only problem with Shohei this year has been the walks and the barrels, right? He is a little bit attackable. And we attack some of these numbers sometimes, right? 59% strike one, 10% walk rate, 10% barrel rate. We go after that, right? Guy's got a 192 ISO allowed to the left side of the plate. 37% hard contact with 1.7 homers per nine. We attack these numbers. So if you want to, on a short slate, short stack against Shohei Otani or even full stack against him, like, yeah, by all means, go ahead. I got no problems with this. 
Um, I don't generally. I want to do it with a, a slightly better offense in Seattle. They're just average everywhere. They all strike out against right-handed pitching. Like Julio hits too many ground balls. Um, Gino is not great against righties. Cal Raleigh strikes out. You know, Josh Rojas doesn't have any high upside, right? He, since they DFA'd Colton Wong, he'll be in there probably at second base. Um, you know, J.P. Crawford's not going to strike out a lot, so that's an all right shortstop play if you want to do that. But uh, you know, not overly thrilling. Canzoni in the middle of the lineup, probably be in the six. He's a cheap outfield punt if you want to get there. That's fine, I think. So maybe like a Cal Raleigh, Canzoni, J.P. Crawford or something um, could be a viable little lefty stack here. But mostly, I would like to stick to one-offs if I'm trying to get leverage on Shohei, uh, or like full-on full stacks, right? From a consistency standpoint, it'd be short stacks, um, you know. But from a raw leverage standpoint, it's got to be full stacks. You just stack Seattle and hope Shohei's bad, walks everybody, or has a blister or something again. So uh, that's kind of kind of how I want to approach it. I don't want to go out of my way to play the Mariners, um, but yeah, some Angels if I can you know, fit them in, in in some equitable teams. All right, last game here, J.P. Sears for the A's. I'm not doing it against the Dodgers. Um, you know, 6,800, I think he's probably a bit overpriced for it, but you now we talked about this a little bit yesterday. This offense over here is n- not good right now. Like, they're missing J.D. Martinez, and they got Ahmed Rosario as a four-hole hitter. They got Chris Taylor, who strikes out a shitload. Um, pretty low upside guys down at the bottom of the lineup, Kike Hernandez and Miggy Rojas as well. Max Muncy from the left side's not been all that great, even though he has pop still, right? So it's really just Mookie, Freddie, Will Smith that you're super thrilled about playing a lot of the time because Chris Taylor strikes out a you know at a 30% clip, um, has pop and he's an intriguing dual eligible outfield shortstop play at 3300. But like, I'm not super jacked about doing this with the Dodgers. I think they might be a little bit popular for the relative upside that they offer. Um, because there's only three guys I'm really excited about playing. And at their price tags, I mean, it's still kind of hard to get to if you want to get to Shohei teams or even correlated teams with uh, Urias. Um, 62 for Mookie, 64 for Freddie, and 56 for Will Smith. It's not easy to get to, you know. This game is in, in L.A., and it's a much more hitter-friendly ballpark than Oakland, of course. And we generally want J.P. Sears a little bit more in better matchups in Oakland because he's such a heavy fly ball pitcher that suppressing contact with all these, um, or suppressing production, rather, with all these fly balls is much more viable in Oakland than it would be in L.A. No matter, like, at 6,800, I'm not playing him. You guys go ahead. It's a six-game slate. But, um, you know, I'm just going to go elsewhere. I'd much rather just take a shot on uh, Brian Wu, for example, you know, uh, target the Angels, or play Adrian Hauser, um, you know, 1600 cheaper or something like that and just not watch the games um so no jp sears for me i, I do want to get to a little bit of the dodgers because fading them on the six game slate seems like a disaster uh will smith yeah mookie yeah but they're fly ball hitters you know so the batted ball profile doesn't match up all that great necessarily um but they're still going to be able to make a good bit of contact and probably hit for some power here so because jp sears does give it up no problem playing freddie of course against anybody in baseball lefty righty it doesn't matter with him um so, yeah, sure, play the Dodgers, but you're going to have to figure out how to get contrarian with it. Do I want to play a Med Rosario? No. <laughs> but he's probably, you know, my favorite batted ball matchup on the team here um, against J.P. Sears, to be quite honest, as a ground ball hitter. Same thing with Kike a little bit. You know, I'm not super thrilled about Chris Taylor. I mean, Miggy Rojas is a kind of interesting um, shortstop play here at 2,800. Rather, you know, play J.P. Crawford or whatever, but... He's interesting down in a contrarian Dodger stack if you want to do something like that. Just batted ball-wise, right? Uh, play like a wraparound or something like that. So it's viable. Um, but it might be a little difficult to go after J.P. Sears. He does suppress contact, and this lineup is not very good right now. I mean, for example, you're only seeing a 5.5 run total on them against a lefty at home, um, a lefty that gives up power. And... Like, normally you'd be seeing this run total for the Dodgers pushing six or seven uh, with a fully healthy lineup here. So they're, you know, it's being reflected here in the betting market, so don't neglect that. Um, That said, six games late. Play the Dodgers. Go ahead. Uh, Urias on the mound for them, 9,800. Yeah, all right. Fishy price tag a a little bit, I think, certainly given the results this year. I mean, give it a 
power in spades. 190 ISO allowed in ag- X ISO allowed. 302 ISO to the lefties. Short sample, but like, okay, whatever. 203 ISO to the righties. The problem with Urias has historically been two left-handers, and it's been on his, you know, really just break-even four-seamer. Um, you know, the changeup this season is really what's been getting him in trouble against the righties. So you can go after him. You know, they've got some okay and equitable hitters over here for Oakland. Zach geloff has been really good to start the season here. Yeah, he had three games at Coors Field, whatever. But uh, Sturia Ruiz may very well get activated tonight, and he was the sole reason we were playing so much of the, well, him and, you know, Brent Rooker power, so much of the athletics earlier in the year. Um, it's because this guy hits left-handers okay, gets on base, and he just steals, you know, every opportunity he gets. And he gets a lefty, so he'll steal second and third here. Um, so yeah, sure. By all means, play Sturia Ruiz if they activate him. Zach Geloff, not my favorite second base play at 4,500, but it's a contrarian play for sure because Urias certainly going to see a lot of ownership as well. I think he probably should. Um, if you can't quite get to Shohei, I'm fine playing Urias. I've got no problems. He's still a better arm than Oakland's offense over here in aggregate. But if you want to leverage this, I have no problem playing Brent Rooker. A little bit of a Jordan Diaz because he's dual eligible and cheap right in the middle of the lineup. He's got pop. Ramon Laureano, yeah, all right, whatever. Shea Langleyer's behind the plate. It's a fine catcher contrarian piece if you want to do that, 3,100. Um, probably staying off of the guys at the bottom third, but uh, it's okay if you want to play a little bit of Oakland here. I don't mind this really. They're certainly a, a team short stack or even a full stack that can get you to full Shohei and I don't know like the Astros or or a game stack um or not a not a game stack a you know stack of the Reds or stack of the Cubs or something like that Oakland can can make this happen so they're going to see a little bit of ownership um they should tonight and I, I think uh because of the batted ball profile and the results for Urias against both sides this year um that said, he's very much in play. Plate discipline overall, you know, outside of the raw strikeout rate this season. He's never been a super high K uh, guy himself. Um, no, but plate discipline for the most part is, is pretty good still so far. He's just, he's been running pretty bad. It's been location, some injuries, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, but I got no problem playing him and really no problem playing a little bit of Oakland on the other side. I, I do like Brent Rooker here at 3,300. I think this is a fine spot. And Siri Ruiz uh, as well. Okay, so that's it. We are done. Quick review, I suppose. Uh, Houston in the end, really starting to come out of Houston here a, a good bit. I think it's a very intriguing stack um, going after Clark Schmidt in tournaments. Yankees are also in play against Javier. You know, these guys are fly ball pitchers for the most part at Yankee Stadium uh, with some pretty severe platoon uh, disadvantages and weaknesses here. So yeah, give me give me some offense here in this game. Uh, I think it's pretty sneaky in tournaments. Pittsburgh, Milwaukee. Uh, I guess mostly pitching here. Some Adrian Hauser, sure, because he's 5200 or 51 or whatever he is. Um, so yeah, yeah, let's make it happen. Mostly Mitch Keller though. I think I, at a you know reduced ownership figure to Urias and Otani um and a Luke Weaver I guess you know it I think this is a, a viable play here Mitch Keller and an attackable lineup uh, it's not super great because he's still got some warts and some things to work on but it's uh, it's okay here some short stacks of Pittsburgh maybe a one off of Carlos Santana Yelich or a free look or something uh from Milwaukee Pittsburgh in play a little bit. Do like Jack Sawinski, hard contact wise. Uh, really like Brian Reynolds though, and a little bit of Andy Rodriguez too. Um, Minnesota St. Louis, Sonny Gray. I mean, I guess like as a super contrarian play, but there's just no upside for him at this price tag. I don't think in this matchup. And that's not to say I want to play St. Louis. Um, I certainly wanted to play them a lot more yesterday than I do today because Sonny doesn't give up any power whatsoever. But this is a six-game slate. You can stack whoever you want. Um, Minnesota's got to be in play, stacking against Libertor. If i got to choose, it's Hauser over Libertor in the, on the cheap end because uh, Libs is just far more attackable here. Some of the right-handers from Minnesota, I prefer short stacks. Kyle Farmer, maybe a Buxton if he if he plays. Um, you know, doesn't get hurt. Free to- tootling around in the clubhouse or whatever. That guy's so tilting. Um, so, yeah, that's fine. But uh, ownership, you're going to have to balance with the Twins because they're very cheap, and it's a good spot. So, uh, pretty, you know, very little for the most part for me. I'm just not interested. I, I don't like the fundamental spot in this game for the most part, and I, 
I don't know. It's just kind of, yeah. Uh, I'd much prefer to get to Cincinnati and Chicago and play all the offense there because both of these guys are mega attackable. Um, I can't play Tyon because the Reds are going to have at least seven right, uh, left-handers in the lineup tonight. And can't play Luke Weaver because he's bad against both sides. So play everybody. You just got to balance ownership here. Um, Seattle and L.A., yeah, leverage stacks of Seattle or, or leverage pieces against Otani. That's perfectly within range on a six-game slate. But give me as much Otani as I can get. Um, he should be probably 60% owned. I think that's probably where, where he will end up. Um, and that really makes sense. But that does make for good leverage plays uh, on the other side with a lefty J.P. Crawford, Cal Raleigh here or there. Um, Angels, too, if you want to go after some Brian Wu. But Brian Wu's got to be in play, too. Um, you know, it's it's viable. Shohei still strikes out, even though he's Shohei. And, you know, Mike Moustakis is, and Matt Dice are not the highest upside bats necessarily. So are we really terrified of them? You know, you got C.J. Crone, Hunter Renfro, Randall Grichik in the middle of the lineup. Um, you know, these guys aren't all too threatening a hitter. So Brian Wu has to be in play at 7,500 as well. Oakland and the Dodgers, um, some Oakland for sure against Urias and all of the dot. Well, all of the good hitters of the Dodgers, let's put it that way against JP Sears, uh, no JP Sears for me. I'm not going to take shots here against a really, you know, even with a, a down lineup, I still really respect them because they're still, um, you know, you just put the Dodger uniform on and you're all of a sudden Ted freaking Williams. So Yeah. That's, uh, that's kind of where we are, kind of how I'm going to approach it. Once again, not going to have projections or anything beginning tomorrow for you know, through the weekend um, into the early part of the next week. Of course, I'll be back um, and uh, you know with the videos and projections and everything uh, as soon as possible. So once again, keep an eye out for pushes. Uh, we'll flesh out this ownership nonsense as soon as we get uh, model updates, as we will later on. We'll push... Uh, early slate projections as well. That's starting here in, in, I don't know, four hours, two hours, something like that. Uh, so keep an eye out for those also. And good luck to everybody here on this Thursday and through the weekend.